So that was IVIG. Now prednisone. Um, so if you'd be to look at the side effects, we have to, there are so many that we have to organize them. It's just unbelievable. But um, you know, the pill is dirt cheap, and um, it's been around for a long time, and in my goodness, it works. It works so well that we've had so much trouble trying to demonstrate the benefits of other medications that we add on top of the prednisone in folks that have autoimmune disorders like myasthenia gravis. And that's why there's all that controversy with CELSEP and a few other things. So adrenal gland, it could cause adrenal atrophy or a thing called Cushing's syndrome. Um, so uh, for those, we usually would tell people to take the smallest dose possible and limit the duration. Uh, adrenal atrophy is the adrenal glands make corticosteroids or prednisone type substances. So if you give it from the outside, the adrenal gland sort of turns off and doesn't work anymore. So when the prednisone treatment is over, then the adrenal gland doesn't kick back in. So Addison's disease is what Kennedy had. So low blood pressure, big fatigue, things don't, weight loss, very, very significant abnormalities. Cushing syndrome is the opposite of that. Too much cortisol, too much corticosteroids, weight gain, uh, sort of a big cheeks and big um, distribution of fat on, on the body, not so much the arms, so thin arms and legs, but, but um, very large uh, body. Effects on glucose metabolism, so high blood sugar. Cardiovascular is high cholesterol and high triglycerides, high blood pressure and blood clots. Central nervous system is changes in behavior, cognition, memory, and mood. Uh, GI tract is GI bleeding, pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas, peptic ulcers, uh, immune system, immunosuppression, obviously it's an immunosuppressant drug, um, and obviously it can activate latent infections. If there was one before, it can make it show up now. Good example would be shingles. Skin, it causes a thinning of the skin, delayed healing if there is a scar or a surgical procedure, increased hair growth in places where you don't want it, face, um, um, sort of a blotchiness of the skin because of bleeding inside the skin, acne. So there are folks that are done with acne, you know, at the age of 18 and then at 35 get put on prednisone and develop acne again, which is nuts. Uh, they red stretch marks on the, on the belly. Um, on the musculoskeletal system, bone necrosis, particularly hip bone necrosis, that can happen very quick after the beginning of treatment, muscle atrophy, osteoporosis or brittle bones, and in kids, growth delay. They don't grow as much as they're supposed to. Eyes, both cataracts and glaucoma, kidney, salt retention and potassium loss, so it needs, it requires um, just modification of intake for so lowering the sodium intake, the salt intake, and increasing the potassium intake. And effects on the reproductive system, um, if, if uh, there's a young woman that, has, that is pregnant and requires prednisone, there's going to be much more likely that, that the fetus is going to be smaller um, and may, ha may have hypogonadism. So what do we do with these? Well, you know, we try to limit the dose and duration. So how is it that we go by to try to help? We tell people to watch their diet, try to be active, monitor their blood sugars. Um, very, very tough tasks. Very, very tough tasks. Um, we, talk to, we talk about psychological support for central nervous system problems. Uh, talk about medications sometimes. Um, GI tract, usually just monitor. It's very common that people that are on prednisone get put on medications that lower stomach acid like Pepsid or the purple pill. And that is a, um, you know, we have in medicine also um, all sorts of legends. So, so we, it gets passed on that if you get on prednisone, you should be on those things. Not necessarily, actually. So you may, you may say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I don't have a history of peptic ulcer disease. I don't have any stomach problems. I'm just going to take the prednisone and wait it out. You don't need another medication to counteract the pot potential side effects of prednisone. So just go slow. Um, for the skin, we don't know what to do, actually, about the thinning and, and the excessive bleeding. I'm going to talk to you about the bones in a little bit. Uh, folks that stay on prednisone for a long time, and long time is three months. So more than 10 milligrams, I know, 
more than 10 milligrams a day for three months, trouble. Um, so periodic eye exams, perhaps at least once a year, if not more. If somebody has a history of glaucoma or there's a family history of glaucoma, you have to be more aggressive about that um, and get at least a baseline reading. Uh, we talked about the kidney a little bit and, um, all right. So it turns out that before we give anybody an immunosuppressant agent, and this, um, is, this, this is going to be uh, sort of a useful, not for just the prednisone, but also for other medications, uh, we have to ask a few questions and do a few things. Is your history of bacterial infections ongoing or prior? So is this immune system something that was working well before or not really? Uh, fungal infections, um, both, you know, lung or nails or skin. Uh, what is the risk for tuberculosis? So it turns out the people that live in inner cities, people that, you know, the, uh, you know their um, income level is lower, people that come in contact with a lot of folks have a higher risk for tuberculosis. Certainly if there is a history of tuberculosis, if there is an exposure, we take that very seriously. We want to know if there are prior herpes simplex infections, both mouth and, and genital organs. We want to know if what the immunization status for hepatitis B and C was. So we want to know if you were vaccinated for hepatitis B, if there's any risk factor of hepatitis C or B, um, and um, you know, if you have future travel plans. So if you have a myasthenic that goes to Mexico every three months, we've got trouble because then we have to think about other, other um, uh, infectious agents that may be a problem there. There are like uh, gastrointestinal and so forth. Uh, we need to check for skin cancer. So we need to look and see if there are any lesions in the skin that are anything close to being cancerous. And uh, in women, we think about a gynecological examination to look for cervical lesions, anything that looks like there may have been human papillomavirus or HPV before. This applies to young women with, with this condition. It's important to know that because what we're going to do is there's a very funny relationship between cancer and the immune system. Cancer is sort of a, there are cells that don't belong to us and the immune system gets active to, to try to control that to a certain extent. You realize that if we put down the immune system, if there was anything brewing, it's going to show up or the likelihood of having a cancer cell developing is going to be more likely. So we're playing a little bit. So we need a few labs before we put somebody on this. So we get a blood count, a CBC with a differential that tells us a little bit about lymphocytes and a few other subpopulation of white cells. We check a urinalysis to make sure there's no infection. We think about varicella zoster virus serology. So varicella zoster is something that we acquire very early and when we're young, but some of us do, some of us don't. So we check antibodies for that to see if somebody was exposed. And that is very pertinent for people that are thinking about a shingles uh, vaccine, which is a varicella zoster vaccine. Uh, we think about this virus called Epstein-Barr, which is something that by the time we're 20, all of us have been exposed to it. So we have antibodies for that. But this is very pertinent for our later discussion on lymphoma. We think about hepatitis B antibodies, HIV antibodies, syphilis, if we need to worry about that. We think about an eosinophil count. Eosinophils are a type of white cell that we can get from that differential. Uh, and think about a stool sample for all sorts of parasites that people can get exposed to when they travel. Uh, we think about the TB risk stratification. So we talk to people about, okay, night sweats, weight loss, chronic cough. Do you cough and spit blood? You know, we think about a chest x-ray and then there is a skin test for, for tuberculosis called PPD and there's a fancier sort of interferon gamma release assay or quantiferon. There's a blood test for, for exposure to TB. So we try to sum up the usual suspects that may, may become a problem if we're going to bring your immune system that was controlling all that down a little bit. 